It's Office Hours Live! Woohoo! Thank you, all of you. <laughs> and it's great to be back. Uh, we're live, you're live, I'm live. The whole purpose of this is to give us a chance once a week, uh, right now, uh, and share this with your friends, please. Because this is, you know, there's not that many opportunities to talk candidly and live about what's going on. And uh, this is Office Hours Live, and we're going to do it today. So share, and uh, if you can't, you know, if you're not here, you can watch later, but it's much better if you are here now. All right? Great. Okay. Today's issues that I want to talk with you about, uh, starting with uh, the rigged election that is not really a rigged election, but what Donald Trump is trying to do, and I can't look, he's rigged the easel. Trump, stop rigging the easel. Okay, here's the point. Uh, what Donald Trump is now doing, and let's be very, very clear about what he's doing and why he is doing it. He is trying to create the impression uh, that this election, and here's Trump, and you all know, here's Trump, and here's his hair. And uh, he's, trying to, he's trying to delegitimize what looks like increasingly the presidency of Hillary Clinton. Uh, and by saying that the election is rigged, by saying that there is going to be, you know, all of this fraud, and by the way, do you know how much fraud we know about in terms of American elections? I mean, the, the amount of fraud is infinitesimally small. The Brennan Center for Justice, uh, one of the most respected centers, uh, issued a report very recently that uh, said that the incidence of, of, of voting fraud in elections is down to .00004. I mean, it, in other words, it doesn't exist. Donald Trump is saying it's all over the place. He's creating this fear that the Democrats are going to uh, somehow uh, not only create uh, all of this voting fraud, but also uh, basically load the entire election in such a way that he's going to, and his supporters are going to lose, and Hillary is going to win. And what he wants to do, folks, I mean, this is important, he knows he's going to lose. He thinks it's a very, very high chance he's going to lose. He's flaming out right now, and he's looking at the future. Donald Trump's legacy, legacy, is going to be not only the ugliness and bigotry and narcissism and megalomania that he has imposed on this election and the xenophobia and his own sort of uh, tangle of, of issues that he is, he's, he's generated and encouraged among his followers, but he also wants to impose on the American system, on our democracy, a big cloud, a kind of question as to whether uh, our system works, as to whether democracy works. Uh, I can't imagine, quite honestly, a worse legacy, a more irresponsible and dangerous legacy. And that's what Donald Trump wants to leave us with. Uh, this guy is a menace. Do you get my point? And uh, frankly, we shouldn't allow him to. I mean, uh, uh, Barack Obama, President Obama this morning, uh, talked about you know, Donald Trump whining. It's worse than whining. Uh, with due respect, Mr. President, every Republican leader of Congress, every former Republican leader ought to be out right now saying this is unacceptable drawing a, a, a kind of a, a pall of illegitimacy over our democracy, uh, making people feel like whatever the outcome of the election is, it's, it's not going to be legitimate, and therefore, what? Uh, they, have, uh, they, should, they should declare a revolution? Uh, this is dangerous. Uh, which gets me to the, the down ballot. Now, so far, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, has sort of distinguish Donald Trump from the rest of the Republicans. She's in effect decoupled Donald Trump from the rest of the Republicans who are running right now for Senate, for House, uh, for the gubernatorial races, uh, you know, saying essentially Trump is, is something different and worse uh, and than normal Republicans. The, the danger of doing that is she's giving a pass 
to the rest of the Republicans. She needs to get the Senate back. Uh, she needs, if there is any possibility, it's going to be very hard, uh, to get the House back. So she has got to link Donald Trump up with the other Republicans, not to decouple him from Republicans. Uh, and a piece of evidence occurred yesterday. I don't know how many of you actually uh, heard about this, but John McCain, Senator John McCain, Republican Senator John McCain uh, from Arizona, yesterday was on the, on the radio uh, in Pennsylvania, and he was asked about uh, the, the Supreme Court, and he said uh, that Republicans will be united against any Supreme Court nominee that Hillary Clinton puts up if she is president. They will be united against any Supreme Court nominee she puts up if she is president. Now, if that's not an argument for a democratic control of the Senate, I have not heard one. If that's not an argument for a change in the rules, once the Democrats get into the Senate, allowing 51 votes to get a nominee to the Supreme Court actually confirmed, I haven't heard a better argument. John McCain, uh, who has had moments, I mean, more than moments of, of respons being responsible in the past, uh, is sounding as irresponsible as some of these other Republicans are sounding right now. This, this is a party that is not distinct from Donald Trump. The Republican Party is uh, sort of, uh, Donald Trump is an outgrowth of the Republican Party. Uh, and Hillary Clinton and other Democrats need to show the public there is that linkage. The Republicans are irresponsible. The Republicans don't care about the institutions of governance and our democracy. And by the way, tomorrow's debate, I don't know what your expectations are. My expectations are, are actually rather low. Here, this is, this is how high my expectations are uh, for tomorrow's debate. Uh, based upon the first two debates, I mean, Donald Trump is going to huff and puff around the stage. Uh, Hillary Clinton is going to do, I think, her best to keep it high rel relative to his, his keeping it very low. Uh, but uh, look, this is his final shot. He, and he's going to go as low as he can possibly go, and that is very low. Which gets me to something else. Several of you, uh, on my Facebook page, several of you have said, well, what can I do besides just voting against him? Uh, what else can we do in terms of the legacy uh, that he is going to be generating? And you know as well as I do that if he loses, and he is probably going to lose, not only is he going to say the outcome is illegitimate, he is going to have his own television program. He's going to actually try to use his presidential run to enlarge the Donald Trump brand and make that brand not only an income, a bigger income producer for her, for him, but also make that brand generate a kind of hatefulness. It'll be brand hate. That's what Donald Trump's brand is going to be. And so several of you have suggested something that I think is actually a very good idea. That is a Trump brand boycott. And what a Trump brand boycott means, and it probably ought to be, you know, started right now, and you can organize and mobilize this. This means making as worthless the Trump brand as is the man behind the brand. And you have all kinds of Trump, the Trump neckties. Should we do a little Trump necktie? Here's a little Trump necktie. Um, that's a little Trump face. A Trump wine. That's not, doesn't look very good. A Trump golf bag. A Trump resorts and Trump hotels, and Trump clothes. Boycott all of this. And, and you've got Trump Towers, and Trump Soho, and Trump International Hotel in, in Washington. You know, the old post office building was a beautiful old building. Uh, somehow, he got hold of it, he bought it, and he's made it, it I mean, there's this gigantic sign that says Trump right in the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue now. Uh, Trump Chicago, Trump Las Vegas, Trump Doral, Trump Toronto, and so on. Boycott. Make sure that your businesses boycott. Make sure that the Trump brand is understood to be synonymous with what it should be understood to be synonymous with, and that is hate. Do you get me? All right. We now take your questions. All right. Uh, let's, let's take your questions, and we will start uh, with the first question. And the first question is from Brian Fugate. 
Uh, what can be done to shorten the election cycle and limit the amount of money campaigns can spend on an election? We need to end this absurd uh, uh, race. Uh, Brian, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think the fact that there, there are fewer than three weeks left in this election, and this is the most depressing, disheartening, uh, kind of agonizing election I have ever been through, and I've been through a lot of elections, let me tell you. Uh, and we do have to shorten the time. Now, there is something called the First Amendment, and we've been through this before. Uh, I think we've got to have a new justice. I hope Hillary Clinton puts a new justice on the Supreme Court pledged to reversing Citizens United and its progeny and making sure that we understand that money is not the same thing as political speech. That's another case, by the way. That's Buckley against Vallejo, which came before Citizens United. Both have to be reversed. Money is not speech. Corporations are not people. Uh, and we've got to have legislation that limits the amount of time in a campaign and limits the amount of money in campaigns. Uh, Mercedes Delacroix. What a great name, Mercedes Delacroix. Uh, how do we end gerrymandering? Uh, Mercedes, we've got to get the actual design of the congressional districts out from under the state legislatures uh, and put it into independent commissions. Uh, California has done that, other states are on the way to doing that, uh, and that is the only way you can depoliticize gerrymandering. Uh, Mercedes, I think it is possible, the way California did it was to actually have a, a measure on the state referendum. Uh, and if your state does have any kind of an initiative or referendum, that might be one way to do it. Maureen O'Brien, all the polls said the UK would stay in the European Union, uh, and then they were surprised on Election Day. Do you think the US could be in for a big surprise on Election Day? Uh, Maureen, I do worry about that. It's not just Brexit, uh, where all the polls show that the European, that Britons, wa the Brits wanted to stay in Europe, and then, of course, you had the vote, and it turned out they didn't. But even in Colombia, uh, with regard to the FARC treaty, all of the polls show that most uh, Colombians wanted that treaty. It turned out that they didn't on Election Day. So what you're raising the specter of is something that I worry about, too. Uh, how many people are telling pollsters that they are not going to vote for Donald Trump uh, because they don't want to appear as if they are supporting Trump? They're a little bit embarrassed about it, but they will, in the voting booth, support Donald Trump. I don't know the answer to that. I worry about it. I'm worried also about the so-called enthusiasm gap. Uh, that is, people who are for Hillary Clinton but not are not going to actually go out and vote, uh, but you've got even uh, at people who are for Donald Trump, even though they're a minority and a shrinking minority because they see more and more of his uh, narcissism and stupidity and uh, his misogyny, uh, nevertheless, they the, the shrinking minority of, of, of Donald Trump voters are fired up and they will go to the polls. All I can say is we don't know, and we won't know for another almost three weeks. Uh, uh, Craig uh, McGregor, at what point do Trump's rigged elections comments become criminally dangerous as incitement to riot or something? It's my understanding that free speech is limited so that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater uh, unless there is actually one. Uh, Craig. I don't think there's any, that I know of, any criminal law uh, that trumps, to use that expression, uh, the First Amendment. That is, uh, you know, Donald Trump can say uh, what he wants about the election being rigged, uh, and that is not a criminal offense, particularly for somebody uh, who is running for office. Uh, but it is immoral and unethical uh, to do that when there is no evidence of that. Uh, so even though he is not, in my view, uh, subject to any criminal penalty or indictment, uh, I think in the, the court of public opinion and the larger uh, ethical world, uh, he has violated a fundamental norm. Uh, Bailey Mannion, uh, what do you think is the future for immigrants in this country? Will it be easier or harder for us? Uh, well, unfortunately, right now, there is more and more evidence of immigrant bashing. I mean, not just Muslims and Mexican-Americans, uh, but uh, a lot of ethnic groups are targeted right now because Donald Trump has made it legitimate to go after immigrants. Uh, I hope 
again, the legacy of Trump does not stay with us. Uh, Hillary Clinton, assuming she becomes president, uh, has a, an opportunity and a responsibility, as we all do, as we all do, uh, to promote tolerance and mutual understanding and to make this nation, once again, what it used to be uh, in terms of a melting pot where people were, uh, were, were, were civil uh, to one another. I mean, most of us are immigrants or children of immigrants or the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of immigrants. I mean, can you imagine uh, what this kind of ugliness could do to this country? And it's not just uh, immigrants and ethnic nationalism, it's also racism. Uh, Michael Mays, why do you need a, an ID to get into Costco but not to vote? Uh, Michael, you don't, you know, voting is a right. Going into Costco is not a right. Uh, Catherine Higgins, is the new political divide between haves and have-nots instead of liberal and conservatives? Uh, Catherine, I would say the new political divide is actually be between the kind of anti-establishment, a kind of angry anti-establishment that has expressed itself either in authoritarian, Trump-like, ugly, vicious populism, or an anti-establishment, angry, progressive movement uh, that has expressed itself in uh, Bernie Sanders' revolution, revolutionary reform movement, a uh, political revolution. And I think that's going to be the choice in the future. I, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people I talk with uh, in the Democratic Party and kind of establishment figures uh, sort of say, well, Trump is going to be gone, and he was an aberration. And by the way, Bernie Sanders was also an aberration, uh, and we don't have to worry about this anti-establishment wave any longer. I think they're wrong. I think what we're seeing in 2016, historically, will be viewed as a the beginning or even just a, it didn't start. Actually, if you go back to the Tea Party and the Occupy movement, both, uh, it started uh, a while back. It started after the bailout of Wall Street. Uh, but this great anti-establishment wave, which is growing, that's the big issue, the big divide in America. Uh, Kay Real, uh, can you please talk about what you think Hillary will need to do after she's elected to bring the country uh, back together? Um, Kay, I think it's very important for Hillary, uh, but also important for all of us. Don't just, just leave it to the president. I mean, it's your responsibility, it's my responsibility uh, to exemplify uh, to everybody else a kind of uh, openness and tolerance and, and to model uh, a, a, a civility that is lacking in America right now. I mean, when I, when I talk about that, uh, let me just give you an example. One of my best friends in the world is a Republican former senator named Alan Simpson. Um, he and I don't see eye to eye on very much. Uh, in fact, he's six foot six, uh, <laughs> and that's why we don't see eye to eye. I can't even see how he sees. Uh, but, um, and and uh, although we disagree on the substance, we're very good friends, and we, we laugh a lot together. Uh, and sometimes when we go on television or appear in debates, uh, people appreciate that model uh, of people who are uh, politically on opposite sides, but who really like each other and enjoy each other. I think that's critically important. Uh, Sherrod Lopez, uh, what will people like yourself do to ensure and help make sure that the Clinton administration does what they promise? Uh, Sherrod, I think it's our responsibility yours and mine, other people who share our views, who we call ourselves progressive, we, we care about overcoming and reversing inequality, widening the circle of prosperity, uh, generating uh, racial justice. Uh, it's our responsibility to push whoever is in the White House and whoever is in Congress and whoever is in the Senate to push them and to make sure they know we are loud and our voices are important and our movement is growing. Uh, you can have the best people in the world in Washington, but if they are not supported by people outside Washington who are organized and mobilized and loud, uh, then nothing good is going to happen because all of the special interests and the muddied interests are going to drown out our voices. So to my, to my way of thinking, the real challenge for us all of us progressives begins the day after election day. Uh, Kiernan Connor uh, pronounced Kiernan. I think I pronounced it right. Uh, if elected, do you think Madam President will ask you to be an advisor or in her cabinet? Uh, I don't know. Um, David uh, 
Carino, uh, do legislators actually write law any longer, or is legislation merely written by special interests and lobbyists? Uh, David, it's a good question. Uh, at the state level, uh, you've got more and more special interests uh, who are writing legislation. Uh, in fact, uh, what's the name of that organization that goes around the country? ALEC. Uh, right, ALEC. Uh, the American Legislative uh, Exchange Council. Uh, they are, they are they're a shill for big business and for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And they write legislation and they submit it to state legislatures, uh, mostly Republicans, and the Republicans take it and they make it law. Uh, well, that, that's inexcusable. It's inexcusable at the federal level. It's inexcusable at the state level. Similarly, uh, Gosling. Gosling, is that how I to pronounce it? What would you do to... Uh, to create jobs. Uh, well, I, I think a major infrastructure program such as Hillary Clinton is talking about and promising is a step in the right direction. Uh, but the fundamental problem we face in the future is not the number of jobs. That's a problem. But the biggest problem is the quality of the jobs, what those jobs pay. Uh, and because of these forces of technological change, and globalization and many other forces, uh, those jobs are not paying very much. We need stronger labor unions. We need to unionize a lot of the service sector in terms of retail, restaurant, hotel, hospital, uh, surface transportation, child care, elder care. Uh, these are where most of the jobs are and most of them are paying very little. And these people deserve to have a voice. They deserve to have the power that comes with unions. Uh, okay, Barb Smith Slater. Uh, what do you think of the measly increase Social Security is getting in 2017? Barb, you're talking about the cost of living adjustment for Social Security, which is something like 3%. Uh, I mean, it's very, very tiny. And uh, my view is that Social Security obviously needs to keep up with inflation, with the cost of living. And my view also is that it ought to reflect the cost of living of seniors uh, who are paying much more for... Uh, for example, pharmaceuticals uh, and health care than are f uh, most other people. So you've got to make sure that that cost of living adjustment really does reflect the increasing cost of living for seniors. Uh, and I think the measly cost of living adjustment for Social Security for 2017, frankly, given uh, increases in drug prices, is not enough. Now, don't get me started on increases in drug prices. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry needs to be completely restructured. The government has a huge responsibility, and we have the power. The government has the power under Medicare and Social Security uh, and uh, the Veterans Administration and Medicaid uh, to exert a lot of bargaining uh, power over the pharmaceutical industry. If the government choose, chose to use that power. Stephanie Friedman, we all agree that it's imperative to take back the Senate, but we need your guidance. Where can we be of most use and how? Uh, Stephanie, Ohio, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Iowa, uh, and I wouldn't stop there. I mean, even uh, it's possible that Nevada and Arizona might be in play. Georgia might be in play. Um, we're doing a series. I'm doing a series of little 10-second uh, down-ballot, uh, particularly with regard to the Senate. Uh, watch them. It'll be on this page. We've already put up a couple of them, uh, and we'll do more. Uh, Tony uh, Chamberlist. Chamberlist? Tony Chamberlist. Uh, Canada loves you. Canada loves me? Well, I love Canada. Uh, but, but here's my, my advice to Canadians, don't put up your wall, really, separating Canada from the United States, because if Trump is elected, you expect so many of us to come north. Uh, Francesca Mies, will you be continuing office hours after the election? Uh, well, I'd like to. Do you, want, do you want us to? Because I will. We will. I mean, there's going to be a lot to do after the election. One of the themes today... I didn't know it was going to be a theme, but one of the themes today uh, is that our work is just going to begin after the election. Uh, John To, I understand the anti-case for the Trans-Pacific Partnership quite well. What are some of the pro-arguments for the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, John, there are no pro-arguments for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is a rotten, rotten idea. Is this the last? Okay, this is going to be the last question. Uh, Candace Jones, do you think people are so demoralized or angry that they won't vote? And if so, what can we do about this? Candace, 
I understand, believe me, because I hear from people all of the time how demoralized they are by this awful, crummy, uh, kind of puerile, childish, uh, but worse than that, an election that seems to be summoning, particularly from Trump, the worst in America rather than the best in America. Uh, I have been around elections since the 1950s. I remember, I remember, I'm so old, I remember the Truman administration. I say that to my students, they don't even remember there was a president named Harry, Harry Truman. Uh, I remember Eisenhower and Stevenson and Kennedy uh, and, and Nixon. I don't remember an election that was this disheartening and this demoralizing. Uh, and I put it exactly at the feet of the Republican Party and at Donald Trump. Uh, well, what can we do about it? What we can say to ourselves is this is not America. This is not the America we know. This is not the America we believe in. If you are lucky enough to be as old as I am, or nearly as old as I am, you remember when Republicans and Democrats got along. You remember when there are people called, there were people called moderate Republicans as well as conservative Democrats. But those moderate Republicans are people like Mark Hatfield. Do you remember Mark Hatfield? Do you remember Jacob Javits? Do you remember, uh, I mean, <laughs> Nelson Rockefeller? I mean, do you remember people who were Republicans, who, who were statesmen, who cared about the country? Now, what we need to do is resurrect the idea of statesmanship. We need to resurrect the notion that we owe each other, as members of the same society, uh, a great deal. Uh, not just if we're politicians, but in, in everyday life. We need to get out of our bubbles and talk to people who disagree with us. We need to create models for everyone of civility. Well, we will do it. I mean. Believe me, we will do it. Uh, we are in the majority. Uh, the, the ugliness, the anger, uh, the, the hate is a very, very small percentage of America. You remember that. You please remember that. All right, we're coming to an end. Uh, let me thank you all for joining us. I also want to thank Zoe Beck and uh, Jobin Gill, uh, who are behind the camera and doing all of this work and they're great. So let's let's all applaud for right for Zoe and Jobin, and uh, we'll see you next week at this time. <laughs>